Part two, the play on stage. My Children, My Africa was first set for grade 12 study in 2016. That's five years ago. And since then, our theatre company, Siasunga Cape Town Theatre Company, in association with Artscape, has produced the play in performance each year for grade 12 learners until COVID-19 struck in 2020. Over the years, there have been some cast changes, but thank heavens Chris Galaba has given his performance of Mr. M each time. That's Fugard's school teacher in the play. In all the productions across the years, we have had to change casts of Tommy and Isabel. And as I discuss my understanding of Fugard's play, I shall use excerpts from the text of the play in performance to illustrate what I'm talking about. In the excerpts, I will show you the roles of Tommy and Isabel, played by Intercausum Juzi and Kate Pinchuk, while in the actors' discussion of the play, which you would have seen already, uh, Tevin Musara plays Tommy and Laurie Todis is Isabel. I have been professor of speech and drama at Rhodes University, and I've been a professional play director since 1966, can you believe it? That's 55 years ago. I first met Asil Fugard when his hugely successful international playwriting career and acting career and directing career was beginning to take off in the 1960s. He lived in Port Elizabeth, and I did a lot of work directing in that city, now called, oh, Gagberga. Fugard and his wife very kindly invited me to come to tea one day at their home at Schoenmarkus Kop on the coast. And that's where I met their young daughter, Lisa. Naturally, Fugard adored her. And he said to me, Roy, you know, in the middle of winter when it's damned cold, I take Lisa's school uniform, fold it neatly, turn on the oven, and then heat her clothes so that she is warm when she's dressed and facing the winter cold. Now that anecdote, though simple in its meaning, is a mark of this man, Athol Fugard. The anecdote speaks about his fundamental humanity, his caring for others, and throughout his long career, he's cared most seriously about us South Africans. Our concern is a play for three actors, My Children, My Africa. I'm presuming that the majority of you young people are using the Pearson publication of the play, and it is to that edition that I will refer in my discussion. My Children, My Africa is not an easy piece to understand. Fugard writing at his best, as here in this play, doesn't make things easy for his readers, nor his actors and directors, nor his audiences. I'd like, though, to challenge all of you with this thought. Do not attempt to dodge or ignore difficulty. One of my mentors in my career has been George Steiner, that great polymath of English literature and of world literature, actually. In a lecture he gave at Cambridge University, he quoted a 17th century Dutch philosopher, Spinoza, who said, and I quote, all things excellent are difficult. Steiner goes on, by the way, to say, and the way you honor a human being is to ask him to put in effort. Rather, accept difficulty as a challenge and respond to it. And you should respond by deciding that you'll dig and dig and dig into the text of a play until you, as an informed and sophisticated 21st century reader, gain command of that text. Once you have that command, you will, as the French theatre professionals say, have joy. You see, that's the function of great literature, to bring to its readers and audiences delight and pleasure, to provide through the wisdom of the writer fresh insights into age-old dilemmas or new ones. I believe, as I move forward towards my 80th birthday, that there's no stage of one's life that one can't be taught something. And honest to goodness, and I mean that, honest to goodness, literature, balances the thrills of storytelling, what's going to happen next, with moral concerns, which it explores in unexpected and surprising ways.
at the outset, a test of whether you're dealing with a playwright at the top of his or her game is how the play begins. Over the centuries, the preferred technique was to begin a play, and I'm going to quote a Latin term now, in media res. Well, that's just a very pompous way of saying in the middle of things. The play begins in the middle of things or in the middle of action. Fugard provides a textbook opening to My Children, My Africa. He cracks into the middle of the debate being held at Zolila High School. There, Fugard is showing us not only the technique of beginning a play in the middle of things in media res, but also his immaculate grasp of another fundamental technique of great literature, novel writing, playwriting. The conflict is fundamental to such writing. Conflict between the characters is a, here comes another Latin phrase, sine qua non, which simply means without which not, you can't write a dramatic piece of work without there being conflict. And as we search through the text of My Children, My Africa, we will witness how Fugard manipulates conflicts in a wide variety of ways. Most particularly, Fugard's overriding thematic concern in My Children, My Africa is the generational clash between Mr. M and Tommy. Mr. M in his late 50s, Tommy, 18 years old, those two generations. This clash presents their contrasting views, understandings of how to deal with the unsatisfactory, sparse learning provided by Bantu education. As you all know, the political offense of 1984 and the school's boycotts organized by the Congress of South African Students as a protest against Bantu education is the driving force behind the major conflict in this play, the generational clash. Act one, scene one, lulls the audience into a false sense of security that at Zulila High School there is harmony, there is discipline, that Mr. M is widely loved and respected by his learners. In fact, Isabel says, I must tell you another anecdote. I produced the movie of Fugard's play, The Road to Mecca. Sitting with him one day, we talked about his plays, and he laid out a simile to describe how his plays operate. Simile, you know, is that figure of speech when you compare one thing to another using the words like or as. He laid out a simile to describe how his plays operate. He said to me, Roy, my plays work like slow-burning fuses. I light the fuse, and to begin with, it sizzles slowly. But as the plot deepens, the conflict of the play becomes more open. The fuse burns more quickly until it's wiggling and waggling all over the place. And then finally, it explodes the dynamite stored at the end of its reach. In that scene where Tommy and Isabel discuss Mr. M that we've just seen, Fugard applies a small match to the fuse, which will burn steadily throughout My Children, My Africa, until it explodes, kaboom, towards the end of the play. In fact, he applies two small matches to the fuse in that scene. First of all, Tommy's deceptive dismissal of Mr. M as being OK. He's OK, just OK, not wonderful. And then as the scene grows to its end, Tommy snaps at Isabel, She's asking him about what he wants to study after school. So, the fuse igniting the central conflict, the generational conflict of the play, is beginning to burn steadily by the end of the very first scene of the play. When Mr. M visits Isabel at her school, Camdebu Girls High, to invite her to be part of the debating team at the school's festival in Grahamstown, okay, Makanda, he talks openly and frankly about the discipline black adults expect from their children. 
Isabel quizzes Mr. M as to whether he's talked to Tommy about taking part in the Grahamstown debate. Oh, and by the way, the number one that Mr. M refers to is the number one classroom. In My Children, My Africa, Fugard writes a profound breakdown of the understanding and trust between Mr. M and Tommy. Isabel, a white outsider, knows instinctively in that scene with Mr. M that he has a blinkered view of his relationship with Tommy. The idea of trust between peoples is most important to Fugard. In the play I mentioned a moment ago, The Road to Mecca, he has the character of Elsa describe to the main character, Miss Helen, the collapse of a love affair. Elsa discovers that the man with whom she has been having an affair is married, and he has no intention of leaving his wife to set up with Elsa. In tears, Elsa reminds us that the big word in life is not love, but trust. As the plot of My Children, My Africa moves forward, we watch as Fugard fractures the delicate thread of trust that has held Mr. M and Tommy together. Act one ends with a riveting speech, a monologue spoken by Tommy, and the young man begins the speech by describing how, as his schooling began, he was enchanted by going to school and learning. Tommy goes on to set out how, as he moved through school, he became disenchanted with the education he was receiving, until we find him at the beginning of My Children, My Africa in Matric, disillusioned and cynical and distrusting Bantu education to its very depths. The National Party Apartheid Government passed the Bantu Education Act in 1953. It was mainly the construct of Hendrik Verwoerd, known as one of the major architects of apartheid. The act limited the curriculum taught to black schoolgoers, ensuring that when they matriculated, they were essentially only useful to the unskilled labor market. As I recall, Favort said publicly that there was no point in providing a sophisticated education for black South Africans, as job reservation really limited their choices of careers through the demands of the unskilled labor market. Insightful Tommy has sniffed the foul stench of Bantu education, and he finds it repulsive. On the other hand, Mr. M really believes that within the apartheid school system for black South Africans, he can maneuver and defy the boundaries that the system sets. Tommy finds this naive. He speaks of Mr. M to Isabel. Mr. M is actually frightened by what is happening in the township. There are strangers from the north stirring up the youth in Brakwater to boycott school. Implied violence stalks Brakwater. Can it be contained before it explodes into physical violence? We shall see. As I noted a moment ago, Fugard makes use of what, we ter what are termed monologues in the action of My Children, My Africa. The monologue can be contrasted with dialogue. Only one character speaks a monologue, and in this play, the monologues are addressed intimately to the audience. Dialogue, by definition, um, is spoken between two or more characters. Fugard's monologues in this play are also textbook examples of intriguing dramatic writing. They reveal bits and pieces about the inner and outer lives of the characters speaking the monologues, but above all, they tell especially diverting stories. Monologue number three, as I've indicated at the end of Act One, Fugard writes a stirring and magnificent monologue for Tommy, the schoolboy, a mighty crescendo, that's a musical term meaning for the growing of sound. A mighty crescendo is that monologue which ends Act One. Tommy in this monologue is clearly addressing a mass meeting in Brakwater, calling the good people to arms. Tommy is firmly set on his path to confrontational politics, and in his monologue, Tommy sets out with crystal clarity 
his instinctual views on the rebellion brewing in Brackwater. Listen to them and contrast his views with Mr. M's. With an ironic sense of humor, Tommy earlier in the monologue has caricatured the white inspector of Bantu schools, Mr. David Hrobolar, Um Davi. As Tommy's monologue stretches out towards its climax, Tommy tears into Bantu education and rips it apart. Tommy's monologue, which brings Act One to a close, is shattering. Crucially, the protagonist of the play, Mr. M. Now, these two words I'm going to use, protagonist and antagonist, are constructs of the Greek philosopher uh, Aristotle. He wrote a book on, on theatre, the theory of theatre. And the protagonist is the leading character in a play, and the antagonist is the one who is opposing him. Crucially, the protagonist of the play, Mr. M, and his antagonist, Tommy, have metaphorically seriously locked horns by the end of the act. Let me take a quick canter through each of the monologues in the play. Monologue number one, act one, scene two, pages 51 to 54. This is Isabel's first monologue. She addresses the audience directly, as Fugard instructs. But it's important for the actress to imagine that she's sharing somehow in confidence her thoughts about what she learnt participating in the debate at Zolile High. I suggest she's talking to a fellow schoolmate. Monologue number two in Act One, scene four, pages 60 to 63. This is Mr. M's first monologue. Again, to whom is he revealing facets of his personality and his beliefs? with his talk about the influence the Chinese philosopher Confucius has had on him. Probably the Reverend Mabopa and his wife, in whose home he rents a room. He rents a room with the Anglican pastor. Monologue number three is Tommy's speech that ends Act One, which I've dealt with. Monologue number four, marching into Act Two now, we encounter Mr. M's second monologue, and what a terrifying speech as is. Oh, sorry. In monologue number two, you can take it from there. Monologue number four. Number four, sorry. Yeah. Monologue number four, we're marching into Act Two now. We encounter Mr. M's second monologue. What a terrifying speech that is, as Mr. M describes his township, Brakvata, up in arms. Listen to the monologue, as it adds meaning to the central conflict of the play and chills us the readers or audiences to the bone. Fugard says that to start with Mr. M's mood is one of quiet, vacant disbelief. Remember that Anele is Mr. M's given name. Mr. M makes an interesting comment in that monologue, which likely underscores the central conflict of the play, the generational conflict. Earlier in Act One, Tommy tells Isabel that Mr. M is, I quote, out of touch with what is really happening to us blacks and the way we feel about things. He thinks the world is still the way it was when he was young, unquote. And in his second monologue, Mr. M confirms this insightful comment by Tommy when he says, staring at the chaos on the streets of Brakvater, no, Anela, I said, I'm quoting from the play, no, Anela, I said, this is too much now. Just stand here and close your eyes and wait until you wake up and find your world the way it was. But that didn't happen, unquote. As Act Two plays out, Mr. M's treasured hope that the world will go back to his world, that Brakvata might reset itself to the way it was when there was peace and order, is a hope that events and ideologies stubbornly refuse to permit. Act two begins with a scene which is deceptively calm. There is conversation between Tommy and Isabel, classic playwriting by Fugard, the lowering of the temperature at the recommencement of the play after interval. But then Mr. M enters 
and Fugard develops the conflict between him and Tommy, especially over the issue of Bantu education. Listen, watch. The battle between Mr. M and Tommy is well and truly joined. That's one of those lovely English expressions when you say a battle is joined is when the two people come together and clash. Shortly after Act Two, Scene Three begins, there's such an important moment between Mr. M and Tommy. Here it is. Tommy has appeared unexpectedly in the school classroom. The rioters have thrown stones through the windows of the classroom. Mr. M has been ringing his bell fruitlessly to try and get the learners back into school. He comments that he presumes Tommy has come to tell him to stop ringing the school bell. In the action, Mr. M picks up one of the stones that has been thrown through the classroom window. In the action of that encounter between Mr. M and Tommy, Fugard creates a vivid theatrical metaphor. Mr. M holds the two opposing forces in his hands, the dictionary and the stone. He is imploring Tommy to reject the stones and take up the words. Tommy rejects the plea when he refuses to take the dictionary from Mr. M. A moment after that encounter, which I've just shown you between Mr. M and Tommy, Fugard presents us with a celebration of words. And as a man of both the theatre and literature, I revel in that celebration. Early in the 20th century, there was a German-born philosopher of, amongst other things, language. He taught at the University of Cambridge in England. He was Ludwig Wittgenstein. On one occasion, he wrote this, and I quote, the limits of my language are the limits of my world, unquote. This insight has haunted me all my life. Language equals words, equals meaning, equals understanding. Here's what Mr. M has to say about the value of words. In his second act monologue, Mr. M demands of himself that he do something to stop the madness of the boycott. Sadly, what he elects to do will be viewed by the people of Brakwater, and in particular the activists, as traitorous. Blaming the unrest on strangers from the north, he shops the rebels to the apartheid police. That use of the word shops, by the way, is another little English thing. It means that he betrays the people, he sells them, shops them to the apartheid police. At Act Two, Scene Three, Fugard writes a tour de force, the most magnificent scene. Mr. M has been ringing his school bell again desperately, meaninglessly. No pupils respond to the ringing, nor to his call, come to school, except suddenly, Tommy appears in number one classroom. And he's there to urge Mr. M to leave the school building. It's been marked for being burnt to the ground and to hide because his life is at risk. Now, Fugard provides another kind of monologue, a long speech for Mr. M, in which he reviews his life, his beliefs, his pride in being an African. But it is spoken to Tommy. He confesses to shopping Tommy's comrades to the police. He refuses Tommy's advice that he should hide, and with a troubled serenity says that the comrade should come and punish him. And Mr. M describes how as that skinny little boy, he asked his teacher if he walked from the top of the pass across the great pan of the Karoo and just went on walking where would he arrive? Mr. M tells us, quoting his primary school teacher,
and Mr. M tells Tommy that he did read the books, and that is how he came to embrace the majesty and beauty of Africa, its peoples, its landscapes, and how that made him, and I quote him, a proud man because I was an African and all the splendor was my birthright. Fugon marks a pause at that point for the actor playing Mr. M, and during that pause, he adjusts his frame of mind as he tackles a fundamentally negative realization that the splendor has shrilled up and wasted away. Listen and watch. Mr. M no longer wants to make that journey in his mind's eye because... Death by fire is one of the cruelest deaths. And as we know, Fugard was inspired to write My Children, My Africa after he read a tiny newspaper report about the actual knifing and necklacing of a school teacher in Cook House in the Eastern Cape. In the action of the play, the necklacing of Mr. M brings to a searing climax the central conflict between Mr. M and Tommy. The following scene, Act Two, Scene Four, and the final episode, Scene Five, Isabel's monologue are used by Fugard to try and make sense of what for Isabel is the murder of Mr. M, but for Tommy is the old man's punishment. In classical music, there's a final flourish at the end of a say a symphony, which is called a coda. The coda brings the piece of music to an end. It may be noisy and dramatic or quiet and reflective. Fugard writes his coda as quiet and reflective in this play, even though at the beginning of scene four, Isabel and Tommy are at each other's throats. Through their debate in the scene, Tommy argues strongly that Mr. M met his just deserts. It was mob justed, but at that time in South Africa's history, all the black people had was mob justice. And so Tommy can't call Mr. M's death murder. With some reluctance, Isabel accepts Tommy's argument. Fugard never wanted to flinch from the difficult and demanding when writing his characters, forces the two young people to face complex choices. And amongst those choices is the one Tommy has made to go into exile. In fashioning that scene, Fugard sketches in some keenly observed developments. Perhaps even more important than Isabel's acceptance of Tommy's argument, is Tommy's heartfelt yet understated confession to Isabel. He says of Mr. M, By the end of this scene, the two young people reach an unresolved reconciliation. I make no apology for dumping that oxymoron into your laps. You know what an oxymoron is? It's when you yoke two different ideas together unresolved reconciliation, and it's typical of Fugard, allowing his audiences to track the direction of the arguments presented in the plays themselves as those arguments twist and turn on stage. Tommy and Isabel are in fundamental disagreement. Tommy and Isabel begin to find accommodation through their disagreement. Tommy and Isabel are finally reconciled or are they? It's just so challenging, isn't it? Then we come to the final scene, scene five, Isabel's meditation at the top of the Warpartsberg Pass. Meditation means to mentally apply your mind to an idea and to gain some kind of calmness. This final scene five is Isabel's meditation at the top of the Warpartsberg Pass. It's monologue number five, act two, scene five, pages 102 to 103. The final monologue and the final scene of the play. Working on Tommy's advice, Isabel has gone to the top of the Warpadsberg Pass to say farewell to Mr. M. She's addressing Mr. M, or rather her vivid memory of him. And the monologue engenders a gentle prayer-like move, something like the still small voice of God in the Old Testament in the Christian and Jewish Bibles. And then it's all over. As Fugard says at the end of another of his magnificent plays, Master Harold and the Boys, 
There has been a hell of a lot of teaching going on.